without, O oh Lord God, the shedding of blood, there was no remission. Because of the blood, the debt has been paid in full, O oh God. Thank you now, O oh Lord God, that you have redeemed us. We've become your prized possession. Come your people, O oh God, by the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, you have brought us near, O oh God. You have brought us into fellowship, O oh Lord, with you. You've made us, Lord, partakers and members of the commonwealth of God. Thank you, Lord, O oh God, that we are not alone in this earth, O oh God. And that you are with us, O oh Lord, by the precious Holy Spirit. We thank you that in spite of circumstances, in spite of what's happening in the world around us, Lord, oh God, we have your word. For your word is true, O oh God. Your word is the anchor, O oh Lord, God of our souls and our hearts. We delight ourselves in you, O oh God. Give you first place in our lives, in our homes, in our families. Father God, in our nation, O oh Lord, we give you first place. We acknowledge you, O oh Lord Jesus, as the one and only true Savior. There's no other way except you. There's no other truth except you. There's no other life except you. You are the one has made a way of entrance for us to the Father. So we thank you, Jesus. Thank you for all that you've done for us at Calvary. Thank you for all that you continually do for us. Thank you for the grace which you poured out upon us. Thank you, O oh Lord, O oh God, for the precious Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us this morning, I pray. Father, I yield myself completely, O oh God, to the precious Holy Spirit. Have your way, Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning. Oh! 
for it to happen. God says, I've made it happen. Amen. Amen. I'm just going to participate. You know, you get three types of people in life. Three types of people. You get those who sit and spectate and watch things happen. And then you get those who wonder what happened. And then you get those who make things happen. So I'm not going to watch it. I'm not going to wonder. I'm going to make it happen. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Amen. There's three times. So don't forget that. There's one thing you came to church for. Don't forget that. Amen. Because you'll be watching. When it happens, then you become a... Yeah. No. Make it happen. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, this morning, I want to share with you on the subject of the wealth of the world. The wealth of the world. Can you say that with me? The wealth of the world. Amen. The richness of the world. Go with me quickly to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Praise God. Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. Someone who's rich is someone who has a lot of money. And many times people have that type of mentality. That being rich means having a lot of money, having a lot of possessions. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. You can have all the money in the world and yet you can still be poor. <clears throat> to be truly rich is to possess that which money cannot buy. Because the Bible says money, money can, listen, what it says there, it says wisdom and money can get you almost anything. It doesn't say everything. 
It can get you almost anything. Hence, it cannot get you everything. I, I've met people who you would consider to be super rich. And yet, they are so depressed. They are so sad. They are so empty. Because there are certain things that money just can't buy. Money can't buy you peace. If you spoke to, you know, some of these rich folk, and especially people who do not serve the Lord, they'll tell you they don't sleep at night. Because they're worried. Because they've got debts to pay and they've got so many responsibilities. Hence, they do not have peace. So the money cannot give them that peace. Money cannot give you joy. It can make you happy. Because being happy is an emotion, it's a feeling. But joy, come on somebody, joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Your joy is full. Joy doesn't run out. Come on somebody. It doesn't diminish. But happiness does. You find some people, when the salary goes in the bank account, they are happy. <laughs> and then as they are ping, 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 and they look at the phone, and the ping, 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 and it comes to the third of the month, and they ping, and all the debit orders are going off, and they check the balance. The more they see the balance, you see, as the balance, as the balance diminishes, so does the happiness diminish. But when you are full of joy, joy, when it goes, when you hear, when you hear and see that thing, you, you're so happy because you know God's going to make a way. Because you know who's in charge of your money. Come and talk to me, somebody. Because you just know. Money cannot buy you a successful marriage. I'm speaking to some of the young, the youngsters, the youth. Those that are watching. These girls think if I if I marry a rich man, I've got it made. Let me tell you something. Money cannot give you a successful marriage. You can't buy that. Somebody. Hallelujah. I mean, we just in the news the other day, you know, wealthy businessmen, wealthy. Look at Bill Gates. Bill Gates. Divorcing his wife. That marriage didn't work. Come on, somebody. Money cannot buy you a successful marriage. It cannot. Money cannot buy you help. It cannot. Hence, to be truly rich is to possess that which money cannot buy. To be rich, if you've got the word of God, you are rich enough. If you've, got the, <laughs> if you've got the word of God, you're rich enough. You've got all that you need. Go to Genesis, the very first chapter, you'll see. There was nothing. But how did everything come to be? The word of God. The gospel of John tells us, in the beginning was the word. And the word was God. And the word was with God. That means if you are in a place where there's nothing, you may have nothing, but if you have a word, you have all you need. I'm reminded of the woman 
Come on, talk to me, somebody with the flour and the oil. She had just a little bit. She was ready for the burial. There's a burial ceremony. She and her son were going to eat their last meal and just die. When the man of God came there, what was he carrying? He was carrying a word from God. And just that word, that word had reached at home so much that they had a three-year supply. Come on, somebody. I'm here to tell you this morning, if you have the word of God, you are rich enough. If you have the word of God, you have all that you need. Come on, talk to me. You may be, listen, you may have applied somewhere. Oh, Jesus, hallelujah. You may have applied somewhere. It's probably for a tender or a business contract, or it could be for a promotion. But you know that the modus operandi is that people are shaking hands at the back. People are bribing their way through life. But I'm here to tell you that no amount of bribery can equate to the word of God. Because the word of God will nullify that bribe. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. The word of God will make a way where there is no way. Money cannot do that. But the word can. Everything in life starts with the word. It all starts with the word. You, as an individual, were created by God. You are a word from God. God said, let us make Eddie in our image. Let us make Felix in our image. Oh, Jesus, I'm not even getting what I'm saying. Let us make Nero in our image. Let us make Wesley in our image. You are a word from God. And when you have His word, you are rich. Come on, say this with me. I'm rich. The word makes me rich. The, the word works. I'm telling you, the word of God works. It does work. You know, I was speaking to the Lord and the Lord says to me this. He says, many people, the mentality, you know, it took me to the book of Hosea. My people perish for the lack of knowledge. They perish for the lack of knowledge. I don't, you're not supposed to perish, you're supposed to live. And sometimes you find, you know, people have the mentality, if I give God money, he's going to give me money. You know, I'm trusting God for a financial breakthrough and the sowing and you know, it's not happening in your time. Remember, God has his time. You know, it may not happen in, in your time. It's coming. It, it is coming. But have you ever considered, when you, when you just pause a moment and ask yourself, when last were you lying in the hospital bed? When last were you stranded in your car in the middle of nowhere? Or there's probably a time you drove with your car and then it was, there was a problem along the journey but you made it to your destination. That's a blessing from God. Do you know somebody? That's a blessing from... You know, we, we count the material but we, we don't focus on the greater blessing that God has given us. I mean, when last did you, were you homeless? You know, all those things, that makes you rich. Talk to me, somebody. Go with me to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 17. I'm telling you, things are going to shift for you this year. Things are going to change for you this year. You're going to see it.
you read Jeremiah 17, read verse 11 with me. One, two, let's go. Are you there? Jeremiah 17, verse 11. Are you there? Let's go. One, two, go. The parties that the Lord does not have, so he will get riches, but not by right. He says, as the partridge sits on eggs and hatches them not, so is he that gets riches and not by his right. He shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at his end he shall be a fool. How many of you have heard of a man by the name of John D. Rockefeller? Ever heard of it? John B. Rockefeller. Rockefeller was one of the wealthiest people in his time. Wealthy. Wealthy, wealthy. He was, he was a billionaire. This man was a billionaire. And at the age of 53, he encountered a problem. He had a problem at the age of 53. He suffered various digestive orders. Yet digestive orders, money couldn't do that. He lost his hair, he lost weight. His shoulders were so sad that he was bent, he had a curved back. He looked like this man couldn't even keep himself up. 53 year old man. And 53 is still young by the way. It's not old. 53. And he was he was struck with sickness. And then when he came close to death, when he was at death's door, then he came to the realization of something. He then realized his main purpose in life was not to serve money, but to serve God. He realized that his purpose was to serve God and to bless humanity. His purpose was not for himself. Because all those years he spent amassing wealth for himself. And at the age of 53, he gets ill, he's in a hospital bed, his money can't help him, the doctors can't help him, nobody can help him. And then he comes when death is knocking at the door, at death's door. He now realizes, I've, you know, I've, I've amassed so much wealth. I'm about to die. I'm not even going to enjoy this. I mean, it reminds me of some people that, you know, you live your life until you go on pension and the day you go on pension, you don't even live to enjoy your pension. Come on, somebody. I had a colleague who worked and the day they had his farewell at work, he was going on pension. They were, they were celebrating his farewell, bidding him farewell. He went to his office, had a heart attack and died. So the man didn't even enjoy his pension. And had over 40 years of service. I mean, you hear of people that go on pension and they don't live long enough to enjoy their pension. Here's a man, Rockefeller. He lived all these years amassing all this wealth. He's 53 years old. Nobody can help him. Now, he comes to the realization that the ultimate purpose and goal of his life was to serve God and to bless humanity. So he then, he then decided he's going to listen to the biblical injunction of giving. And then he realized something. He began to realize something. As he began to give out money, so his health improved. <laughs> it's remarkable. As he was giving out, his health, his state of health, improved. 
The man lived to become 98 years old. 98 years old. God gave him 45 more years. It reminds me of 2 Kings chapter 20 from verse 1 to verse 7. The story of King Hezekiah. You remember Hezekiah? Hezekiah was lying on his bed. He was on his deathbed. And God comes to tell you. see, when you re if you have the word, you are rich enough. Because God came and gave him a word. He said, Hezekiah, you're going to die. You're not going to get up from that bed. I'm hearing that Hezekiah rent his clothes, turned towards the wall, and he repented. You see, it's the same thing Rafter fell down. He turned to the wall. He turned to his maker. He turned to his creator. Because you must understand, you were never created to worship or idolize anything of this world. You were created and designed to worship God, your creator. You can, listen, it is stupidity. You must be highly stupid to worship something created with hands than to worship the Creator. Oh Jesus. Oh Jesus. Who's gonna claim them not for me? Any much. Any much. I'll give it back to you. I'm not bothered. You will give it back. Trust me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Yes. Who created this? Where does this come from? South African Reserve Bank. Where does this note come from? It comes from the bank, right? The Reserve Bank. They printed this stuff. What is this made of? Made of paper. Where does that paper come from? From the tree. So who created that tree? So who's the source of this? So why worry about this? Why worry about what Ned Bank says about your account, your EPSA, your FNB, your Standard Bank, whatever bank you bank with? Why let that? Why let that cause you to lose your joy, cause you to frown, cause you to be depressed, cause you to be sad, when you can turn to the one who created all them notes that are there by that institution? And by the way, they're there on loan. I say that they are known. If you don't believe this, how many of you remember Sambo Bank? Sambo means build together. Overnight, that, was, that bank closed. God, the doors to that throne room never closed. Those doors never closed. You see the bank, they even give you hours when you can go when you can go to the bank. From this time to this time. Out of those hours, sorry, you have to do it either on your banking app or the internet. But if it's very, very important, you gotta wait for Monday. But with God 24-7, you have a direct line, you have direct access. You with me? You were designed and created to worship God. Listen. When we look at the book of Psalms, Psalms, when we go to Psalms, Psalms tells us in verse chapter 53 and verse 1, it says, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. If you're living your life like there is no God, you are a fool. 
And that's what Rockefeller realized at the age of 53, that he'd been a fool all his life. Because he thought money brings happiness, money brings joy, and money brings you peace. Money can buy you love, money can get you love, money cannot do all those things. Hallelujah. You see, it takes the wisdom of God to preserve life. That's what we just read in the book of Ecclesiastes, is that wisdom gives life. If you are wise, you listen to God. If you are foolish, you will not listen. You see, it was a wise thing that that woman had Zarephath had been listening to the man of God. What do you think would have happened if she didn't listen? She would have died. See that? She would have died. When you look at 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 7, they had to make a cake of figs. They made a cake of figs. Hezekiah ate it and he recovered. You see, you see, you give God something to work with. Remember, you are a partner with God. When you start acknowledging God in your finances, financially things will happen for you. Oh, Jesus. I think I'm in the wrong place. When you start acknowledging God in your finances, financially things will start happening for you. When you start acknowledging God, you know, in your workplace, things will start happening for you in your workplace. Because many times you think it's the man that gave you the job. No, that man or that woman did not give you the job. It was God by His grace who gave you that job. Hence you find many people, they're so afraid to stand up for what is right because they're scared they'll be fired. No, you stand up, you listen, look at Job. Job lost everything, but in the end, God gave him so much more. You must be a person of integrity. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. You see, acknowledge God in your workplace. When you're doing your work, don't do it like, oh, you know, uh, I'm just doing it for my basement. You'll never get promoted. You'll never get recognized. But when you do it as you do it unto the Lord, it becomes a sacrifice unto Him. And God blesses it. And God honors it. He hallows it. And all of a sudden you find, listen, un unexpected and unasked of promotion will come to you. You didn't even think of promotion, but promotion just comes because, listen, promotion, the Bible tells us, the Word of God tells us, promotion does not come from the north, south, east, or west. Promotion comes from God. God will promote you. If you are unemployed and you start acknowledging that it is only God who can get you employment, I'm here to tell you that God can change your status from unemployed to employed. He can change your status from unemployed to employer. He can change your status from employed to employer. Employer. That's the type of God we serve. Hallelujah. If you start acknowledging God in your marriage, your marriage will start working. If you start acknowledging God in your family, your family will start working out. If you start acknowledging God in your children, you'll have these problems with your children. Come on, talk to me. Money cannot fix your children. Cannot. Met some people, they battle with their children. The children are addicted to drugs, the children are doing all sorts of things stealing, involved in crime, all these things. Listen, money cannot fix that. But there's someone who can, his name is Jesus. Come and talk to me, somebody. You need something to work with. When they were faced with the multitude in the desert, what did Jesus say? Bring them to me. Because he said, Master, there's just a young boy here. He's got a few loaves and a few fish. He said, bring them to me. Bring them to me. 
see, you're battling with your child. God says, bring the child to me. Bring that child to me. You must acknowledge that it is God who's in control of everything in life, in your life. Who wants somebody? You know, maybe, you may find, you probably have a problem with your car. And you go to mechanic, 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 and nobody, they, nobody can find the problem. Maybe it's time God said, how about you partner with me concerning this car? <laughs> Come and talk to me somebody. It could be with your body. No doctor knows what's wrong with you. Yeah, because there's a doctor of doctors. His name is Jesus. He's the great physician. He's the healer. How about you? He says, come to me. Come to me, all of you who are weak and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, it takes the wisdom of God to preserve life. You know, you, many times we've heard this and we confess this. We've got Zoe life. Zoe life is the God kind of life. We have the God kind of life. Life as God intended it. Did you know you also get the God kind of wealth? The God kind of wealth is, is wealth which doesn't run out. Wealth which doesn't run out. Because the God kind of wealth is the only wealth that guarantees life. And that comes to the Word of God, the study of the Word, the reading of the Word, the meditation of the Word, and not just that, the confession of the Word, the praying of the Word, and the application of the Word. You see, having the word is not enough. You've got to do the word. Practice it. As you practice it, this word is supernatural. It is, it is supernatural in nature. It's a supernatural. This, this word is not of natural origin. They may have printed it somewhere in a printing press, but the one who inspired these words to be written it's not a man, the Holy Spirit moved men of old to write this word. God himself wrote this word. So this word is supernatural in origin. Hence, it is supernatural and dynamic in working too. That's why I say, the word works in spite of what you see. Put the word there. Over your children's lives, put the word. They're telling you there's no hope for South Africa. Our children are going down. Put the word of God. The Bible in the book of Job says there's hope for a tree if it is cut down. At the first scent of water, it will sprout again. In other words, what is water? The water is the word of God. Put some water there. You have dreams and visions. I told you, listen. This year, your dreams will come to pass. I don't care what your neighbor said. I don't care what your family said. I don't care what society said. I don't care what the government said. I'm here to tell you, if you can dream it, you can achieve it. Because the word of God, you've got to take the word and put word onto those dreams. You see, many of you, your dreams are like in a valley of bones. You see those dreams and all you see is bones. You don't see those dreams coming to life. But God said, listen, prophesy, speak my word over those dreams. They'll receive life. Amen. You are the one that gives life to those dreams. Amen. Don't let other people's words and opinions cause you now to die and you speak words of death and you keep those dreams covered in the cemetery or in the graveyard. No, 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 no. 
This year, it's going to come to pass. It's going to come to pass. You may say, but pastor, this dream is too big. Listen, you serve a big God. You serve a big God, hence it is not impossible. All things are possible to him who believes. Are you with me? Because listen, when you study the word, faith comes. When you study the word, wisdom comes. Through the word of God, you will receive an idea. The word will give one idea from God, just one idea. You'll achieve what many have tried to achieve in a lifetime, you'll achieve it in a day. Give God a try. Acknowledge God in everything. Talk to me, somebody. Look at Solomon. Solomon was the richest man of his time. You remember Solomon, King Solomon? The Bible says he was the richest. The richest man. And what happened? When you read the life of King Solomon, God not just gave him wisdom, but God gave him rest on every side. There was no adversity and no enemy that can come that could come to Solomon. Listen, sickness is an enemy. Rockefeller, sickness was his enemy. But when he began to live right with God, death even left. Sickness left. And he got 45 years. Hezekiah's life was also extended. Come and talk to me, somebody. Hence, you see, wisdom can guarantee you life. And wisdom comes through the word. Hezekiah received a word from God. I've heard your prayer. I will restore to you your life. I'll give you more years. You listen, nobody knows day and day. Nobody. But you know, just by being living right with God, that day can be extended. So you're looking at me like that. I told you about Hezekiah. If it happened for Hezekiah, the Bible says it's a God who doesn't change. So I believe it. If God could do it for Hezekiah, he can do it for me. I told you, I came here this morning to come and believe so that I can receive. If you don't want to believe it, it's okay. You don't have to receive it, but I'm going to believe it so I can receive it. Acknowledge God in everything. Acknowledge God in everything. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. Jesus speaks to that rich man. You know, he spoke to this rich man that had all his wealth. And the man said, I'm going to build more silos for my wealth. And that night, God comes to him. And God says to him, you fool, your soul is required of you tonight. Now who's going to enjoy all that wealth? That rich man was a fool. Why? Why? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Anyone who will not acknowledge God in his or her affairs and tries to strive on their own strength, is regarded by God to be a fool. Imagine God calling you a fool. If a human being, if you know a human being tells you, listen, you're a fool, you get angry, right? You get angry. <laughs> you say I'm stupid, you say I'm a fool. But imagine God saying, you fool. You couldn't argue. So my question is, why work hard all your life? Why work hard? Why suffer? Why strive and struggle to lay up wealth? And yet in the end, you have no guarantee that you're going to enjoy it. Why? That for me is foolish. In Jeremiah 17, we read that the partridge sits on eggs and hatches them not. Imagine a partridge sitting on the egg and the eggs are not hatching. 
says, So is the man that gets riches and not by might. He'll leave them in the midst of his days. At his end, you'll be a fool. Imagine at the end of your life, you're a fool. It's nice to live your life like the Apostle Paul. Live a full life. A full life. That even when you've lived your life and you look back, you can say, my God, thank you. I've lived a good life. I've run my race. I've finished my course. And now there is laid up for me the prize. There's a heavenly prize that I've been striving towards. That's what we must strive towards. You are a citizen of heaven. God is not against your success. He wants you to succeed. Write that for me. God, write, write it to yourself. God is not against my success. He is all for your success. He wants you to seek Him first so that He can guide you the right way and He can preserve your life that you'll be able to enjoy your success. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, brothers and sisters in Christ, the road to success is not an easy one. It's not an easy one. You ask any successful person, they'll tell you it is not easy. It's not easy. It's that road to success, that road to your destiny, it's not easy. But it's worth it. There are many pitfalls. There are many, there are many pitfalls. There are many pitfalls, there's many downfalls, many things happen. Look at, look at Joseph. Joseph's destiny was governor in a land in which he was a slave. Imagine in the land that you were a slave, you become the governor. You become the chief in charge. I mean, Pharaoh was chief in charge. And just under Pharaoh was Joseph, a slave. What about everybody else that was born in that land? Can you see what God can do? Yet, it was not an easy road for Joseph. His brothers betrayed him. But he didn't get upset with them. I mean, they dug the pit for him. They threw him in the pit for him to die. Then they said, no, you know what? We'll sell him and make money. So they sold him out. But little did they know, in selling him out, they were sowing towards their destiny. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I don't know who I'm speaking to here this morning, but someone may have sold you out. But you don't get better about it. You just get better. Because in the end, listen, they just sown towards their, their destiny. somebody. And then Joseph gets to Egypt. In Egypt, he's sold to Potiphar. In Potiphar's house, it looked like things were going well. Everything was given unto Joseph's care. Yet, Potiphar's wife now, she fabricates a story. She has eyes now. You see, whenever you're on your way to your destiny, the enemy is so, listen, he'll use whatever means possible to keep you back from your destiny. Because Potiphar's wife, now she looked at Joseph, man, this man is desirable. Yet, Joseph upheld his integrity. He said, I will not sin against God and my master. My master has given me everything in his house. I'm in charge of everything. I can put my hand on anything except his wife. And then Joseph runs for his life. And what she does, she grabs his garments, 
fabricates a story, thinking she'll shut off his life. Little did she know that that was part of sending him in to his destiny because the garment he had in Potiphar's house is nothing compared to the garment he wear as a guy. He ends up in the prison, and even in the prison, God gives him favor. God is about to give you favor. Listen, one, God, one moment of favor is better than a thousand years of labor. Because just that one moment of favor, things can change for you. You remember Esther? Just one moment of favor changed things around for her. I'm here to tell you this morning that one moment of favor is on your way. I see things shifting for you. And then you find that the guy that got out forgot about Joseph. Now you may be thinking, oh, but you forgot about me. Oh, you know, I applied, but they forgot about me. <laughs> it will come to remembrance. Oh, Jesus. It will come to remembrance. Wait, wait, wait. There's a CV here. Sister Ashley, you better tell Kelly. It'll come to remembrance. It'll come to remembrance. I'm here to tell you, it'll come to remembrance. It will come to remembrance. I remember, I saw a CV somewhere. I remember, I saw an application somewhere. Come on, talk to me. I'm talking, listen, I'm talking about, you know, promotions that are supposed to be advertised that will not even be advertised because there are CVs that are in the archives. Somebody is going to go to the archives and they're going to select. They're going to select it. And listen, you may say, yeah, but pastor, they advertised it. But even before the advertisement went out, they remember that there's a CV that they pulled out. They know who they want for the job. Amen. If it's a tender, if it's a business contract, somebody's going to remember. Amen. Somebody's going to remember. Amen. Hallelujah. We don't serve a God who forgets. God doesn't have amnesia. He doesn't forget. He's not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should repent. Has he not said, will he not do it? You find now, they remembered, ah, there's a man there in the prison who taught him out. In that instant, Joseph's status changed. Here to tell you, your status is about to change in an instant. This journey of life is full of pitfalls and downfalls. And no man, no man, no woman can make this journey on their own, in their own strength. They'll never make it. Because anybody who's struggling their way through this road, through this journey, while ignoring God's instructions, is destined to fail. Destined to, listen, you're destined for destruction. But if you hear God and you put God first, things will work out right for you. Amen to that. In 1 Timothy 6 verse 9, you find the Apostle Paul. He warns those. Hallelujah. He warns those who seek wealth outside of God's world that they will fall into temptations, into traps, into foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. There's a warning, the Bible warns. It says, money is not evil. It is not evil. It's the love of money that's evil. Read intelligently, the Bible says, the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money. With me? Amen. So we are not to seek wealth, but we are rather to seek God first, and then He'll guide us along the road and get us to the wealthy place that He has ordained for us. 
God has already ordained a place for you. He's destined a place for you. And whilst you're on this journey, don't set your affection on things that are of this world. But set your affection on things above where Christ is. Set your heart on things above. Set your heart on Jesus. Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. You see, if your heart is there, it means your treasure is there. You can start making what draws from your treasure. Are you getting what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Amen. You see, this journey of life, you have to engage the help of God. You have to engage. You, you cannot do it on your own. You've got to engage the help of God. And you, can, you have to allow Him to be the one to guide you. Not just him. You've got to just listen. Let go and let go. Let go and let go. You know, I've heard of testimonies of people who had near crashes. Had near crashes. And Pastor Sheldon had one a few years ago going over the road. And this guy, you know, skips the road in front of her. She just let go of the steering wheel. Car came to a complete stop. I believe she still carried on. Could have been detrimental. I mean, you hear people that tell you these things. They were almost in an accident. All of a sudden, they let go and they just shout, Oh, Jesus, and the car stop. You see, because you get to a point in your life that just tells you that sometimes you may think that you're a good driver, but you're actually the worst there is. It's true. You may think you're a good driver. I'm a good driver, but you're the worst. Because there's somebody who drives better than you, and his name is Jesus. Amen. Because when when you're gonna meet, when you're gonna face an accident, you're not gonna rely on your on your driving skills to get you out. The only thing that you re then you remember, oh my God, oh Jesus. You see, when you get to a point where you let go and you let God, you are saying, Lord, I cannot do this. I cannot do it on my own. I want you to drive this vehicle to my destiny. You've got to let go and let God. You cannot do it on your own. Amen. So you've got to, you've got to engage his help. And in engaging his help, how do you engage his help? You ask him. That he who lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally. Ask that your joy may be full. See, your joy is your petrol level. It's always full. But God wants it to be, you know, overflowing. When you ask, you're engaging God. And then you allow him. How do I allow him? By doing what God asks me to do. You know, you may ask you to make some, you see, maybe your, your relationship with your spouse is not working out. But if you engage the help of God, God might reveal to you some things that you're doing that you need to change. Could even be with your children, but you don't understand them. God might just reveal you. It could even be in your workplace. You don't get on with the boss. You don't get on with your co-workers. Nobody gets on with you. If you engage his help, God might just show you there's something that you need to change. You see? And now, I ask him for help. He tells me, he shows me, now I've got to do it. And that's how I allow him. 
Because I cannot go to my own strength. As difficult as it may seem, God will give you the grace to do it. You, it may be someone that you're bitter with for, I don't know how long, you just can't forgive. God will give you the grace to forgive. It may be someone that, you know, you. the Bible says love everybody. You, you know, you love everybody. You say, I just can't find it in my heart. God will give you the grace to do it. You can't turn the other cheek. God will give you the grace to do it. Why do it? Things will work out for you. There are five things that God wants to do as a guide. Number one, God will go ahead of you and make all the crooked places straight. Once you engage His help and you allow Him to direct the course of your life, then God steps in and He goes before you and He makes all the crooked ways straight. Where you are meant to fall, you will not fall. Where you are meant to fail, you will not fail. Where you are meant to be retrenched, you will not be retrenched. Oh, come on, talk to me, somebody. Because retrenchments are going left, right, and center in this country. But I'm here to tell you, if you engage the help of God, God will make those crooked ways straight. Hallelujah. The second thing that God will do, He'll break the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron asunder for you. You break the gates of God. In other words, where people are trying to make limitations for you or closing doors for you, God is going to break. You see what I said here? Remember I told you earlier on, where people are bribing their way in, God is going to close that. God will close that door. As of violent bang. Going to close it. Because when he shuts, no man can open. When he opens, no man can shut. Talk to me, somebody. You serve a God who declares the end from the beginning. Talk to me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell somebody here this morning, God says to you, have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? It's high time you got up from that pitiful place and that pity party and took that cake and put, listen, it's a cake of pity. It's a bread of sorrow. Throw it away. Get up from that pitiful place. Dust yourself. Stand up to your feet. Dust yourself. Put your shoulders back and your chest out. You know where they tell you to do that? In the army. Why do they tell you to do that in the army? Stand up straight. Put out your chest. Roll your shoulders back. Lift up your head. Why do they tell you to do that? It's because you are a somebody who's representing somebody. They're telling you you have dignity. Hallelujah. The third thing that God will do for you, He will give you promotion. God will give you promotion. Unexpected promotion will come to you. Promotion you didn't ask for. Promotion you didn't even think of will come to you. I'm going to tell you that long before you even ask, God will have answered. That's what God will do for you. He'll give you promotion. God will promote you. Many think that Joseph going from Potiphar's house to the prison is not a good thing. It was a promotion. It was a promotion. Don't despise small beginnings. Don't your beginning be small. Your letter will be greater. Praise the Lord, somebody. The fourth thing that God will do He'll give you wealth and give you health along with it. What is it if you have wealth, but you're not healthy enough to enjoy it? God will give you wealth and He'll give you health along with it. Hallelujah. You may say, but how will God give 
Thou shalt remember the Lord your God for his evil gives you power to create life. You are wealth created, it's just that you don't know it yet. You've got to come to that revelation. He says in his word, I will give you the treasures hidden in secret places. <laughs> Hallelujah. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. Wouldn't you like to be in on God's secrets? Wouldn't you like to be in on God's secrets? I mean, God even spoke concerning Abraham. He says, I cannot hide from Abraham. I cannot hide what I'm, what, what I'm about to do. At night, on your pillow, God will speak to you. In your prayer closet, God will speak to you. In your vehicle, on your way to work, on your way to the supermarket, God will speak to you. Jesus says the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of wisdom. He'll give you wisdom. He'll give you understanding. He'll give you the word of knowledge. Like Rockefeller, he received the word of knowledge. That this is why this is there. Many people, things are happening in their lives, but they don't understand why. But you want to you gotta become acquainted with the Holy Spirit. He'll give you the word of knowledge. He's the best friend there ever is ever will be. The Holy Spirit will not phone you and tell you, listen, watch Oprah Winfrey. You know that problem you're facing. Oprah can't even help herself. How should we help you? Dr. Phil can't help himself. How should we help you? Are you hearing what I'm saying here? The fifth thing that God will do for you, He will give you life. He wants you to have life. Abundant life. He'll give you life and he'll give you peace of mind to enjoy his blessings. That peace of mind is that in spite of the pitfalls, in spite of the challenges, I just know God is in control. When others are running helter skelter, I'm at peace. Be still and know that I am God. That's all he says. The disciples were running helter skelter on that ship. Come to Jesus. Jesus was sleeping in the midst of the storm. Because he knew the Father was in charge. The Father was in control. Your heavenly Father in control. Your heavenly Father is in control. I don't care what's happening, what's rocking your ship this morning. But your heavenly Father is in control. Others may run to you and say, don't you care that you perish? Say, oh, you are living of faith. Learn from Jesus. When people start coming to speak fear to you, that's how you answer them. You must remember, it's not the person. The person is not driven to do that. People are not your enemy. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. Our wrestle is not with people. Our wrestle is not against the man. Our wrestle is against the spirit that has control over the man. You must understand, that there's an agent of darkness that's using this person to come and bring fear into your life. Words of fear, words of doubt, words of discouragement. You've got to recognize it. Remember what Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and the voice of a stranger they will not follow. 
You must recognize which voice is coming here. If it's a voice, if it's something that's going to cause division, that's going to cause dissension, that's going to cause heresy, that's going to bring about fear, you say, I rebuke you. And you may say, but pastor, the person may get offended and just say, oh, you have little faith. That person must recognize that who they're speaking to, it's a man of faith, it's a woman of faith. Let it be said on the day when you breathe your last and everybody comes to bid farewell, they don't say, oh, this person lived so long, didn't even enjoy their pension. Let them say one thing. Doesn't matter at what age you die, but let it be said. Man, this man, this woman, as a person of faith. Let it be said, let it be known that this person was running that race, the race of life, but this person held on to the faith. This person didn't let go. This person held on to the battle. You see, you come to church this morning. This is a relay race. This is where you get your strength from. This is where you get your encouragement from. This is where you get your armory from. This is where you get your baton from. And after the service, you're going to take the baton of this world and you're going to face a world that is very cruel and very dark. But you're going to shine in the midst of that darkness. And you're going to take that baton. And whenever the enemy comes to speak to you, you're going to use that baton and tell them, Oh, you are little faith! When they say, oh, no, but everything's in you, you say, oh, you have little faith. Peace be still. Peace be still. Peace be still. Listen, you are not at the mercy of the waves. The waves are at your mercy. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. Jesus wasn't concerned about the waves. He wasn't concerned about the wind. Jesus just said, peace be still. You say peace, peace. Maybe you go to the doctor, he gives you a terminal, you know, a diagnosis, which is not a very good diagnosis. But you can just say thank you for the information, doctor. Thank you so much. But I have the revelation that Christ has healed me. I walk in the light of the revelation that I'm the healer of the Lord. And every day you speak to yourself. You say, I'm healed. By his stripes, I am 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 healed. You, you see, and then you start speaking to your body. You say, you comply to the word of God. You comply, you comply, you comply. Listen, when you are a person who complies to the word of God, your body will understand the type of spirit that's in the body. So when the spirit speaks, the body will comply. kind of a mouthful. You see, your body, you are not this body. The real you is the spirit in this body. Don't let the body dictate to you. You dictate to the body. The spirit of a man is a candle of the Lord. God speaks to your word. That word goes to your spirit. And once it's settled in your spirit, you start ruling from your spirit. Because when you start speaking and you're speaking the word, your spirit man is growing, your spirit man is becoming stronger and stronger. Your spirit man is growing. And as your spirit man is growing, now all of a sudden, your spirit man can dictate to the body to comply to the word that's in the spirit. Hence, this body must comply. It must comply, it must comply, it must comply. That's why sometimes people think it's stupid when we tell you, speak, speak the word. Speak the word of God. Speak it over your home. Speak it over your cupboards. Lord Jesus. Speak it over your cupboards. Speak it over your house. You're with me. When last did you walk seven times around your house? When last did you do that? Seven times. And as you're walking, you're praising God that there's no sickness, no disease, no poverty, no lack, no failure, no drought, no disease.
spare, no damage. You remember a few years ago we had those tennis ball hailstones. You remember that? When that happened, Joshua was asleep. We went to his room. We took his bed away from the window. We put it in the center of the room. We were living in Surreal. Kurt was by his grandma. And Pastor Sharon and I, we just prayed. As soon as that hail so as soon as we just prayed, we prayed in tongues. We walked up and down the passage. We walked into every room praying in tongues. That when it stopped, when it stopped, we opened the door because we heard people walking all over. Some people were shouting, screaming. When we walked out, our neighbors, they were all saying, oh, our windows are broken. The roof was damaged. The things came. The hailstones came into our home. I remember across the road from me, there's a Hindu guy. And he asked me, he says, hey, Ricardo, any damage? I said, nothing that I can see. This man was telling everybody, only Ricardo's house got nothing. It's not Ricardo, it's the God Ricardo serves that stayed that house. Not even a window was cracked. Not even a window. I remember my car was being repaired somewhere else. My car normally parks outside at the back and I was getting, I was telling Pastor Sharon, it's now four days I don't have my car. Praise God, my car had come in where it was. And when I drove to go see my car, because the guy that was busy when it was overseas, the hailstones went through the roof sheeting. No damage to my car. Except the car in the That's the God we serve. Now, that's why I say, when you have the word, the word that, listen, when that storm is happening, you tell me, you can tell the storm, I'll give you a million rand, please don't damage anything. You tell me you can do that. That storm ain't listening to nothing that's coming out of your mouth. And if you give that storm the word of God, everybody around you begins to say, what manner of person is this? Even the waves and the storms are pain and fox. Hallelujah! You may be saying, Pastor, you know there's so many promotion opportunities that come in the workplace, but I can't get them. Nothing's happening. When last did you walk seven times around your office, around your desk, and you just praise God, praise God, praise God? Because Jericho was shut up, but they had to take Oh, talk to me. Seven. Seven, the number of perfection. When God is finished with you, it's going to be a perfect thing. Because he says, thou shalt perfect all that which concerns me. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the treasures of God are never on the shallow end. The treasures of God are never on the shallow end. They're always buried in the depth of God's words. It takes a personal discovery to get there. I cannot do it for you. I can get you, you know, to show you where it is. But from there, it's left to you to go in. Please don't become like all our fellow brothers. You know, what's happening in this country is atrocious. Somebody you don't know comes and tells you something. They, I mean, they tell you what food you ate yesterday. That's got nothing to do with my future. And then you go deeper, go deeper, go deeper. No, I want to go deeper in the word of God. I don't want to go deeper in somebody's mind that's corrupt. Only yeah. God can do what I say. Yeah. That's foolishness. Go deeper, go deeper. Go deeper what? My problems, I want to go deeper with the word because this is what God is saying. I don't want to hear what this man is saying. I mean, they pay people off in the church to come and make lives there. No, 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 that is madness. I'm telling you now, 
This is all the word of prophecy you need. It's the word of God. If you're watching me, you go to the word of God. This is your prophecy, not some proper joke soaked from nowhere. Those treasures are deep in his word. You've got to take a personal discovery to get there. It takes a personal choice and a personal decision. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we stand? Amen. As we stand and we close, we're going to take the offering. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you are in control of our lives and of our destiny. You feel that you your destiny to be so. Come on, let us just pray together as we pray. Say, Heavenly Father, help me, I pray, to build my life upon the solid foundation of your precious word and prayer. Let my focus be always on you and not on money. Help me, O Lord, to pay the required price, to lay the needed spiritual foundation for all my endeavors by seeking your kingdom first. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.